Um, all right, so welcome to another Creative Spin podcast. I have to read all of this because I still haven't memorized it. This podcast brings you a weekly conversation with entrepreneurs, artists, and uh, basically anybody that's creative and that wants to talk to me because I need to talk to people. That's how it goes. <laughs> Good. And today, today we're going to talk about acting, I guess. Most of it. Yeah, the, the industry, for yeah, sure. Like for all sure. aspects of it, I think. And we're here with Patrick. Patrick Creary. Am I pronouncing that you right? You are. It's like creepy, but with an R. That's <laughs> Welcome. How, that's how I say it. Thank you. So, Patrick, you're an actor, producer, writer. But how about you tell us a little bit about your background? Where you were born, your social insurance. No, not, not, none of my that. My SIN but. number is 555. <laughs> Um, okay, well, so I was born in Calgary. Like the, the little summary of the your summary. Life. Yeah, I was born in Calgary, grew up there, um, and then I went to University of Queens uh, in Kingston, and I started off in physics uh, because I wanted to be a lawyer. So I thought I would get a physics degree and then go on to law school. Uh, and I took a drama elective, and uh, uh, four years later, I ended up leaving with a degree in drama. There you go. So yeah. you had no ambition of being an actor prior to that no or? I mean I was the class clown and I like yeah. to make people laugh but it wasn't it wasn't I wasn't doing drama classes like okay. there's a story actually that my mom so I hate dancing and and my mom when I was little put me in a folk dancing class or some kind of a dance class why wouldn't she right and yeah. but but the reason but I was the only boy and I got bullied like all the girls would throw shoes at me. So I was like, I'm not going to dance ever again. And that's funnily enough, come back to haunt me in my adult life as an actor. Really? Yeah, because I'm a double threat. I can sing and I can act, but I, I don't dance. Well, so you know what? Uh, after this podcast, I can give you a couple of lessons. And, that's uh, we'll, absolutely. We'll go. <laughs> we'll go tango around the so lobby. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> we'll shut off the cameras and we'll just go. Yeah. Um, so you started in acting and like how did well, this like so, how did that all start so right? yeah so i was i i lived in banff after i got my degree at university and i applied to law school and i did really well on my lsat but i hadn't been the best student at university like i was sort of middle of the road mm -hmm. and it wasn't it wasn't strong enough to get into law school and at that point i had been toying with like i'd done some shows at university and i was i, I was liking it and I, I was thinking about this as a career so i thought you know uh, at the time, I was working in a restaurant in Banff, and I thought, well, eh, I'm doing okay on minimum wage. So Let's you're become what? an actor. So you were what, 21, 22 at that point? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and <laughs> math. You're asking me to <laughs> math, do math. Uh. No, no. I, yeah, but that's about right. So that was, and then I moved back to Calgary after a year and a half. And then in 95, uh, I decided to move to Vancouver to pursue it. So I was there for about eight years. And then... Uh, and and the move was really because basically more work in uh, in Vancouver. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. Okay. Uh, but at that time too, I was also focused on working in the theater. So mm -hmm. around uh, nineteen ninety eight ninety nine, I went to Lambda, which is the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Arts in England, and okay. I did a one year postgraduate in classical theater. Uh, How was that? It was great. It was a fantastic year. I I loved it. What about culture wise? How culture wise, yeah. I mean, meh, yeah. <laughs> what, well, no, I, I just, you know, when you're a student and you're doing a program like that, you're so focused, well, I was anyway, so focused on the program. So mm -hmm. I didn't, I did get to see a bunch of shows, like, because you'd get student discounts. I remember being in a pub, actually, uh, uh, on a Friday, and uh, Slava Snow Show was coming through town, a Russian mm -hmm. clown show. And uh, sort of, it was like, you know what, this starts in about... 40 minutes. Anybody want to come with me? No, you guys want to keep drinking? Okay. So I hopped on the tube and I, I head down there and I get rush tickets and it's one of the best experiences I've ever had. Like really? it was an amazing show. So in terms of culture and being able to see stuff, like when you get into the bigger centers like that, yeah. like I went and saw Alan Rickman and Helen Mirren do a production of uh, Antony and Cleopatra at the, uh, at the National Theater. I saw um, Kathleen... Um, the one with the voice, the deep voice. Mm -hmm. What is her name? You know what, uh, Kathleen? Uh, oh, I'm terrible with Is names. it Turner? I think it's Kathleen Turner. I'm awful with it too, apparently. But she did <laughs> She did a production of The Graduate, so I saw that. 
So uh, w- you know, what do I you mean, like? What do you like to do m- most? Is, is you like theater? Or you like uh, you know? I I've moved away from theater. Uh, I I do still love the theater. I mean, and I did a show in Calgary right before we moved uh, out to Toronto at Theater Calgary called The Audience, mm-hmm. uh, where I played Prime Minister David Cameron, uh, opposite uh, Shauna McKenna, who mm-hmm. is uh, just she's she's an amazing human being and performer and yeah. actor and she's just received the order of canada and that was like an absolute career highlight for me that's awesome yeah but do, do you um i i hear a lot of actors saying that you know once you do theater and you start getting that instant feedback from the audience yeah it's a completely different feel is that true I guess, yeah, but, but so, so, but I started in theater, right? So, mm-hmm. so then it's talking about going into film and television and and that medium and enjoying that. And what I like about the film and television medium is that that stuff is around forever, mm-hmm. right? So you you do it, and then you can like the biggest role I ever had was something called uh, it was Pete Kennedy on a on a movie of the week uh, called Dear Santa. Mm-hmm. Which you can find on Netflix. Yeah, I've where actually I'm wearing my my peek. pink chef's outfit. Yes, it was very nice. It was fun. It was a lot of fun to do, and that. But that was. But that was Zoe's eight. So that filmed when when I when she was just turning one. Wow. So so that was seven years ago. But I still get to watch that. Do you know what I mean? Whereas the, the plays good. that I've done. Like I went and had dinner with my dad's partner and she was talking about some of the shows and she was reminding me and I was like, oh, I don't, I don't even remember that show or, oh yeah, I'd forgotten I'd done that. Right. Because yeah. you do it and you do it for those people and then it's gone. Yeah. But the, but the other thing about theater that's so, so magical and amazing is that the amount of time that you focus on the part, right? Like you're mm-hmm. in rehearsal for two and a half weeks. I was just going to ask, like, it depends, I guess it depends on how big of a part you have, but like. What what's the time frame? It's a, you know, like if you've got a five or six week run, usually you're in you're in rehearsal for two weeks, and then and then there's a transition into when you move into the theater. So then so then that period it, you're doing technical rehearsals, so you're still kind of rehearsing, but it's actually more for the technicians. For now this is just me being sort. curious. How does that all work? Like obviously you're gonna learn your lines, but then and then there's another part where you're you're together with the other actors, yeah. and you have to kind of go over everything together and like uh, explain a little bit uh, like how does that all work okay well so so you get you get your script and you do all your preliminary work before you start the first day rehearsal and then at the first day rehearsal you all show up and sit around a table and uh, you read the script and you have a director the director's usually got a vision for the show yeah and they're doing (laughs) (laughs) we're laughing because i feel uh, i feel like we're in a subway or something there's uh, somebody's dancing upstairs and uh and it's kind of coming through the 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 floor but it's okay this is the boy this is texture this is texture exactly this is the kind of podcast we do around here it uh we don't we don't let anything interfere but as you were saying uh because you forgot (laughs) no no so so then you do your um so then you do your read and then uh and then they just break it down and start working the scenes. Uh, uh, it's actually, if I get to relate it to, like you and I met doing karate. So, yeah. so when we're doing our katas, uh, you, what I do is very similar to how I prepare and perform a play is that I start working on the smaller beats. Oh, I thought you were going to say you punch and kick people around. No, no, oh, no, okay, no. Okay. no, that's if it doesn't go well. <laughs> but so, so you, so you, you have the, the kata as a whole, but I, you work on the phrases and the mm-hmm. small, and then the transitions and you, you work on the moves in, in minute detail and then you start stringing them together and then you start doing the whole thing and then you'll go back in and you'll work the little bits and the transitions that don't work mm. and then you'll expand it out. So, so when you're doing, when you're doing theater, that's also, part of what it is mm-hmm. uh you, you know you you want to make sure that you're responsible for your bit but also how that pertains to the whole because because you really you're telling a whole story so so yeah. everything I, has to flow the right way yeah and also i think there's a certain amount you have to be present right and so you mm-hmm. have to know what your character's doing but you have to be present enough that you i had a, an acting teacher who said acting is just improvisation but with more rules like, if you have a script, the yeah. rules are that these are the words that you have to say. But within those words and, and phrases and stuff, you, you, you're improvising because you're in the moment. So yeah. you're getting what your partner's giving. You need to be giving. the character, too. Yeah. Right? You need to get into that feeling of what the character is probably thinking or feeling and all of that, right? Yeah. 
And then you have, there's certain traps you have to avoid. Like if you're doing something that's really emotional, you can't go too far down that emotional rabbit hole because mm. the audience doesn't want to see the actor break down. The audience wants to see an actor fighting breaking down because that's what we do as people, right? As human beings, we don't, we try and fight it. We don't want to go. Interesting. I never thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, (laughs) so like if you, if you see a performance and they, and they break down and they emote and you're like, wow, that was really good. But if you see a performance and they're trying hard to fight that and you can resonate to that, then it allows you as the audience member to have that cathartic. (laughs) Never thought about that. Yeah. And then, and you know, and then there's the beauty of, there's the beauty of timing, uh, and in theater you get that immediate response from the audience. But then you have to be careful because then if you're like me and you're a laugh whore, then you know <laughs> you're always trying to get the laugh. But sometimes yeah. the laugh doesn't serve the story, so you need to, you need to, do you know what I mean? Like yeah. you're serving a bigger story and a bigger vision, and that's that's what's really sort of cool about it and what mm-hmm. i love about it do you do you advise anybody that's getting into uh acting to to obviously try theater and, oh, and be in theater 100 percent. the reason i was so focused on theater early on in my career is because all the great actors whoops sorry i'm gonna hit the microphone <laughs> all the all the great actors that i watch and look at and admire yeah. all have theater backgrounds yeah and that's also because in the theater you have longer with the story and you have more of an opportunity to tell bigger stories like in film and television when you're doing that you meet the person on the day you're shooting you rehearse it twice and then it's in the can there's Mm. no like sort of generally a rehearsal process unless you're at that level where you're the lead character but you you have to work your way up to that by doing all these sort of one and two line parts so when you're up there at that level they do more rehearsals is that what you're saying it depends it depends on how they want to structure the thing right like sometimes you know you hear about directors uh uh, who was I it? was just going to ask, like, directors have a big hand on that, right? Oh, like, 100%. Okay. 100%. But as an actor, like, this is what's great about having been a writer and a producer and being on the other side, right? Like, I haven't directed a lot, but being a producer and all that uh, puts, puts it in perspective because then you realize that the actor is like a small, small piece of a huge machine. Mm. So, So there's nothing worse than being... The actor who shows up uh, is a prima donna douchebag, doesn't have their lines, is sick, steals all the food from the craft table. It's like, as a producer, I'm going to murder that person, and I'm probably not going to work with that person again. Yeah. Like, like do you find a lot of those? Kind oh, yeah. Of, yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. Because it's people who don't know better. Right. Yeah, I guess you get uh, those people everywhere. Right? Well, and it's also at the level that we're <laughs> at the level that we're at. Right. Like if I'm self-producing a, a web series or whatever, yeah. then there's a the, then I don't have a whole lot of money to be able to pay people. I mean, I found money and we paid everybody. Yeah. But but I'm not I'm not getting those A list people. I'm getting the the best people that I can afford who are interested in doing the project For the project. Yeah. And they're earlier on in their careers. You're touching on uh, web series. Um, do you think that uh, now with, you know, with social media being the thing it is, the monster it is nowadays, and do you think that there's going to be more and more um, more things done on the web only as opposed to being done for TV or for, for the bigger screen and all of that? Do you think, I don't know, for, for like, do you mean other, Netflix or do you mean self-producing well, or what are we? We've got Netflix. We, we've got yeah. YouTube. YouTube now is is kind of growing quite a bit as well in terms of you know their premium stuff. And yeah, all but that. they're getting away from that model because it's not working for them. It's not working. No. but they were trying. But what do you what do you think about that? Do you think you're seeing now a lot of actors actually uh, Hollywood actors getting into doing their their own little uh, you know, vlogging and, yeah. and doing their thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What what's your opinion on all of that? I think it's a hundred percent. I you know I've always said it's it's the future, and it's cutting out the middleman uh, or it's a it's a shift in power. But cutting off the middleman is it a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it depends. I mean, mm. I I think it also has to do with money, right? Like one of my favorite expressions is it ain't called show art and it ain't called show friends, right? Mm-hmm. There's a business aspect to it, and everybody wants to produce and do their own content. It's because if you're just an actor waiting to act, then you're at the mercy of whoever is 
got the money and got the parts. But if you want to develop as an artist and you want to create your own stuff, you know, we have cameras on our phones now that are, yeah. that are 4k. Like we can, we can do that. You need, you need two lights, a tripod and the weekend and you can mm -hmm. create content. And so, so, and I think, you know, you and I are both fans of Gary Vaynerchuk. The market yep. will tell you if they want it or not. Yep. So you have all these YouTubers that are putting out content and they're doing very well. And the ones that are good, they're getting picked up. That's sure, but line. it's also because they do it more, yeah. right? Like the gatekeepers don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Like if you want to get onto Netflix, if that's your goal, then yeah, you have to go through that. And then there's access to more money that way. But if you're someone... Like if you're a non-union actor who's just trying to put together some sketch, you, there's nothing that prevents you from doing that. Yeah, there no. are no barriers to entry, right? Like you, you can write it, you can film it, you can edit it, almost all for free. You can upload it for free, and then you can build your audience. 100%. Yeah, my next question was going to be about that. Like, what do you think about today's world and technology? You've kind of answered all of that already. But well, I, I mean, I love it. Compare it. Compare it though when you started yeah. or. Back in the day, like we like to say. Yeah. <laughs> like, like back in the day. When I had you know? to walk uphill both ways to school <laughs> in the snow. What's the biggest difference? It's really that. It's the fact that now we don't have, I think anybody that's starting off, there aren't so many gatekeepers, right? I think that's the and also, biggest. And also financial barriers. Because that was a big one. Like back in the day, if you wanted to do, You'd if you to wanted to do. You a whole bunch of people, right? And yeah, but it's also like you, you, you were filming on film. Well, that's expensive, man. Like you, you the so then, the so then VHS and uh, V uh, and then uh, DM uh, DV video comes. Like yeah. I still have a DV camera with tape on it, so you know that wasn't cheap, but it was way cheaper than what it was before. And now, literally, your iPhone, like yeah. two iPhones, tripods, you're done, and, and you're, you're using natural light, yeah. and and you have so many also like. Like lynda.com, you can access that through the public library. True. And then you can do any tutorial on anything. Like you want to learn how to color correct in Final Cut Pro? Yeah. There's I mean, a free tutorial for that. So YouTube. YouTube is, is and grown YouTube. to That's a right. point where you can learn basically anything nowadays on YouTube. Oh, I was it's fixing my amazing. dishwasher by looking at YouTube the other day. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> How well, did that work out? <laughs> cleaning it out. No, it was good. I mean, it was good. I was like, uh, can I do this? And I watched it and I went, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. But then sometimes I watch them and I go, yeah, I'm going to call someone. <laughs> so that's good. That you saves me You need to really money. know your, uh, you know, how much you can or can't do. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, in my perspective, I think nowadays, uh, there aren't many excuses anymore. If you want to be an actor or anything for that matter. There's, no, there's a, what was it? You can Sam? put yourself out there, man, and just. I think it's Sam. Uh, oh, okay, Sam Robert. I want to. Mm. <laughs> it's good to know I'm not the only one with. No, it is. Bad it's, memory. It, 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 off camera, he's a photographer and he does uh, uh, interviews with actors. Uh, okay. And I, I can't. Oh, I wish I could remember his name. Um, I should Google it. But he he did one with um, with Hotel Rwanda. Um, do you know his name? I, I'm, Do you I know him, Colin? What the guy was in Hotel Rwanda, hmm. and he's uh, he plays Rhodey. Okay, we're officially all ones. very bad with names. <laughs> okay, well, all, those of you listening have Googled it to know who I'm talking about now. Yeah, but he he says you want to be an actor. Be an actor. Like, are you reading plays? Are you going out to see things? Are you doing? There's scenes? really no. Excuse. Are you yeah writing? It's like you what producing? you were saying. Just get your phone up, yeah. record every day, get better in your craft. Yeah. Put it I up. mean, the thing with the thing that's challenging for me, uh, and it's just I have to spend the time looking into it, is because I'm a union actor. I'm part of ACTRA. There's paperwork around that, mm -hmm. and there's a cost associated with it because ACTRA is there to protect the actors when they're on set. Yeah. Now, you're like, well, what do they have to protect you from if you have like a camera and a weekend and you're doing an across the table thing? Well, it's just there are rules there for protection so people don't take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a cost associated with that. So you have to have insurance. You have to be able to insure the actors in case something happens. So so those are minor costs. Like, And if you're going to be doing it on a regular basis, then that's just an investment in your career that you can write off at the end of the year anyway, right? Like, exactly. So, so the barriers are... Don't, don't, you can't let that stop you. It's, you just have to figure out a way around it or through it. So I mean, it's all straight to the point. What would you advise somebody that's starting or that wants to start 
If you're actor. starting and you're a non-union actor and you want to be in film and TV or you want to be on theater, if you want to be in theater, you can find tons of community theater programs. Uh, who have auditions, but ultimately what you should be doing is if you want to be an actor is you should create. You need to be a creator, especially if you're a woman, uh, especially if you're uh, identified as uh, a minority, not minority, a person of, of uh, color, uh, if you're LGBTQ, whatever. If, if you're in one of those uh, groups that's marginalized or doesn't have the same access as middle-aged white dudes, then then you should be creating your content because you'll have an audience for that. There's Yeah, I think, honestly, the audience is now shifting tremendously. Until but even because it's so micro, you if you find a small pocket, that small pocket's going to support you if you put out content regularly 100%. and good content. There's a great show. And just just on a side note, is uh, Alberta Theatre Projects is doing the Canadian Curling Club. It's a world premiere. Uh, play and it's about immigrants who come to Canada and they're in a small town and they join a local curling rink mm. so that they can learn curling and then the woman who's supposed to teach them is sick and then her husband shows up to teach them and he's kind of like a, a bit rednecky and maybe not the guy who should be teaching them but the point I'm making about this is that this show is the single ticket highest seller of any show uh, barring a, a holiday show in ATP's history. And so many immigrant uh, uh, people have come to the audience and were laughing and crying, and we're talk they're talking to the actors afterwards saying, thank you, that's my story. Yeah. So it is important to be able to, to tell relate. those stories and to see those stories. But, but in terms of you as a creator wanting to do that, the barriers are very... They're, they're non-existent, really. I mean, you're, you you're making excuses if you're not doing it. Go out, do it. Yeah. Just make some noise. And find an audience. Yeah. Your audi or your audience will find you. And, that's and what do you think about... There's this... And you see it also in, in YouTube and all of that. People trying to copy other people and all of that. What's your advice in that sense? Be original? I th Yeah, I mean... I'll use stand-up as an example. Like... All stand-up comedians have people that they grew up watching and admire and, you know, like, they, then they try and emulate them. And as part of trying to emulate them, of course, you're going to start sounding them, yeah. uh, like them, until you start finding your own voice. And then you're going to become unique. So so if you're copying someone because it's the your intention is to try and get those followers, eh, maybe not the best thing yeah. to do. But if, if you're doing it as part of the process to figure out who you are going to become... Like I always say, you know, there's a there's a difference between copying and being inspired, right? Sure. You can you can look at other actors and get inspired and and try to you know because that's what you like. Yeah, and, that's and who you, you are, and, right? and I think you know, like as part of your young development, you're going to emulate, and there's going to be a certain amount of crossover. Hundred percent. You know, yeah. but but at a certain point, you start having your own voice and you have your own things to say, and then and then you have to just be true to that and do it. One last question. Just one? Yeah. Okay, go. If you had a DeLorean and what you can go DeLorean. back in okay. back in time, yeah. what would you tell your younger self not to do? Like a mistake you did in terms of of the acting field, of of that world. What did you do wrong? If you did anything wrong. If oh, you didn't, you oh, just go no, back I've and you done, say, Good no, job, no, no, Patrick. Buddy, I've done tons of things that are wrong. <laughs> Absolutely. But something that, that could resonate with the audience and say, you know what? I was thinking about doing that. Now I'm not going to do it. I think there was one. There was one time when I was a young, a young actor in my career, and I was at a professional theater company, and I sort of waded into a political thing that was happening at the company, mm -hmm. and I had no business wading into it. But I felt like I needed to say my piece, uh, and and that I've never worked at that company since then. Yeah. And, and you know what? It wasn't my place to necessarily say anything. But, you know, you're young, you're passionate, you want to mm -hmm. feel like you're involved, oh, and, you know, I you're know. an artist, you want to change the world. And I think, I'm not saying that you shouldn't, um, like, if there's something wrong going on in a company or something like that, then You for can sure. have an opinion. Yeah, but I think, I think... Not a passionate opinion? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? I mean, I just, I just, that... That didn't have anything to do with me, and I yeah. should have just left it alone. I think that's I think you got to focus on advice. the work, and I think that's the thing. Like I'd rather, 
just focus on your work and your journey. That's that's the tough thing too. That with social media, there's so much ability to. There's so much out there that you're always. It seems like everybody's doing something but you, mm-hmm. because it's all coming at you. But if you sort of dive a little deeper, you realize that that one person who's posting that they just got nominated for a daytime Emmy, that's like four years of work. Yeah. A lot and of then that focus. person who got the Canadian Screen Award, that was three years of work. But or you're more. just getting it all at the same time. So you think everybody's, yeah, it's all instantaneous. And that, so, so that sort of, you know, I, I would say try not to, try not to get caught up in what other people are doing because it's your path and your journey. Just focus on your work. I agree 100%. You see, I see that a lot in, in my field of work um, in terms of graphic design. A lot of the younger designers, you know, they're passionate. Yeah. As was I when I started my company yeah. 15 years ago. Well, you that's know, why w- you did it, right? I would stress out, and mm-hmm. I would, you know, if I, you know, a client would come in the door and say, "I want this done this way," I would, I would go ballistic. No, you're you're wrong. And now I'm like, okay, let's talk about this, right? So yeah, patience and and uh, knowing your your where you should stand and what you should say and not say. I think that's that's one of the most important things. But you. You're going to need to make those mistakes. Oh, uh, for yeah. sure, for and, sure. And don't experience be so, is just ex- is mistakes. Yeah. That's all that is. And don't just take it to heart. You know what I mean? It, it's going to happen. Yeah. And that's how you learn, and that's how you go ahead and and do it. No, you, I agree. I, you, the other thing too, I just want to touch on what you were saying about the clients coming in, and you're like, no, I have to do it this way. <laughs> there's there's a lot of that in the acting world too, where you're like, no, this is how I'm going to interpret it, and I think part of it, part of what I think is important is to realize that you're providing a service. Yeah. Like you're a service provider. So and, it's great. But and, you like, and as an actor, you're, you're basically providing the service of a vision that that producer had. Well, right? I'm serving yeah. someone else's vision because yeah. if I'm not the director, then yeah, I can have opinions on it, but I'm mm-hmm. not, I'm telling the director's story. So, so if you're a young creative, you could probably have an opinion on the character more than you the absolutely story, right? can, but, but, and you should, you should have an opinion and you should have, and that's where those conversations start happening. Yeah. Right. But, but, but it's not, you're part of a story. It's not, you know, I always joke because people are like, what's the play about? Like, I, I have a supporting character role. Like, there's a, there was one, Heidi, Heidi, a holiday musical. And they said, so what's that about? And I said, it's about a goat herder named Peter. And he meets this girl <laughs> named Heidi. Because that's my character. So for yeah. my story, that is the story. Yeah. But that's not the story, right? Yeah, so exactly. you just have to, you, yes, tell your story. But understand that your story is in... Rosencrantz and Crandon's Guildenstern by Tom Stoppard, great example of a play where he takes two minor characters from Hamlet yeah. and then creates a whole play around them. It's Amazing. brilliant, right? Yeah. But that's, yeah, anyway. Patrick, anything else you want to add? Oh, buddy, I can talk all day. You know that. So <laughs> we'll just, maybe we should call it that. I'll, 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 I'll catch you back at the dojo. Yes. And uh, kick you around a little bit. That's right. Or vice versa. Kick and punch. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, dropping by. Oh, my pleasure, man. And uh, we'll be ready for the next one. Yes. Yes.